Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers, and today's topic is going to explain what hemoglobin A1c is and what that means biologically and why it's so important, not only for diabetics, but for anybody looking at metabolic health. Folks, if you find value in these vid uh, videos, they're kind of scientific, but they also make us think a little di bit differently about our own bodies, please hit the subscribe button. And if you hit the little bell that's next to that, as I post new videos, typically on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you'll a little reminder will pop up and then you can either delete the reminder, delete the video or say, hmm, this may be something I'm also interested in. And, and folks, we really appreciate thoughtful comments, positive or negative, but make them for thoughtful, um, share your mind and ask questions. I love my trolls. I love it when, when the trolls uh, say things that test my emotion management system. But the comment section below is not really meant for trolls. If you want to go ahead and make me laugh, but let's get into A1C. And okay, so without too much biology, here's the way it works. Your, re your bone marrow and your liver most of your bone marrow produces red blood cells, red blood cell corpuscles, um, that when mature float around in your bloodstream and they pick up oxygen in the lungs and deliver oxygen to your tissues for respiration, for energy uh, uh, breakdown and energy uh, utilization and making energy. That's what oxygen does in our bodies. Now, the interesting thing about red blood cells is they're dead. They're deceased. They're dead. By the time they enter our blood cell, uh, our our, our um, blood vessels, they have lost their nucleus. So they're basically carrier molecules. They go around and they've got hemoglobin inside of them, and the hemoglobin picks up oxygen and delivers it. And there are certain types of hemoglobin that have high affinity for picking up oxygen. There's certain others that have high affinity for delivering it. And we have that healthy mixture. When our hemoglobin gets damaged, and there are certain things that damage that hemoglobin, really the molecule gets transfigured, it gets deformed by certain things that attach to it. And one of the things that attaches permanently to hemoglobin is sugar, glucose. And we call that glycosylated hemoglobin. Glucose attached permanently to the uh, hemoglobin. It transforms that molecule and radically reduces its ability to pick up and deliver oxygen. That's the problem. And we call the percentage of hemoglobin molecules in our red blood cell mass we call that percentage the hemoglobin A1C percentage. So when you measure your A1C, it's a percentage of hemoglobin that has been permanently glycosylated. Now, the other piece, just I'll come back to that in a second, but the other piece to understand is that um, red blood cells are continuously being produced by the bone marrow, mostly and a little bit by the liver, and the place they get removed if someone doesn't stick, <laughs> stick a needle in your finger and in, in, your, in your arm take out blood, the place that we, the graveyard for hemoglobin uh, is the spleen. And what the spleen does, and a little bit the liver, but mostly the spleen, is it breaks down hemoglobin to its component parts, and then your bone marrow rebuilds it. That's pretty much the way it works. So the lifespan of a, and this is crazy, the lifespan of a dead red blood cell, because they don't have a nucleus, but the lifespan is 120 days. The lifespan's 120 days, plus minus. Some of them get out a little bit early, so if you've got abnormal uh, hemoglobin, like thalassemia or spherocytosis or sickling, um, they get destroyed earlier, but the typical average lifespan is 120 days. So if that sugar permanently bonds to the A1C, you have a dysfunctional hemoglobin uh, within that red blood cell that's going to float around for up to 120 days based upon when it got damaged, and then it's going to be replaced. So the hemoglobin A1C logarithmically changes, for those math scholars out there, logarithmically changes in three-month or 120-day cycles on average. Shorter or longer, but that's the ballpark that we're dealing with, okay? So, and, and how does uh, um, that hemoglobin 
get affected? Well, it gets affected specifically by the chronic concentration of sugar in the blood vessels, the chronically elevated blood glucose. Spikes, massive spikes in blood glucose can also affect it, but it really is the average level of blood sugar that's elevated, and that's why we can correlate hemoglobin A1c with other damage to your blood vessels that we call diabetes or prediabetes. Now, under normal, under normal circumstances, you have to have sugar in your bloodstream. Typically, a blood sugar in American metrics of around 65 to 75 uh, uh, milligrams per deciliter. And that's the, that is a healthy blood sugar. And under those conditions, between 4.8 and 5.2% of your red blood cell hemoglobin is going to be glycosylated. So a healthy hemoglobin A1c is 5.2 or lower. Any hemoglobin A1c above 5.2 demonstrates chronically elevated blood sugar levels. Think about that, folks. So if your A1c is 5.5, most doctors, oh, you're perfectly normal, you're healthy. Well, that difference between 5.2 and 5.5 indicates damage to your red blood cells. Now, here's what, so, I was going to use, uh, I'm not going to use, I'm, I'm a doctor, I won't use any other words than my favorite medical word. So, here's what's bizarre, and what's so dysfunctional, is that we only make a diagnosis. Remember, 5.2 is, is, is about your normal upper limit. We only make the di diagnosis of diabetes at 6.5. And why 6.5? Because an A1C of 6.5 is where we start to treat with medication. That's where you go on your metformin. That's where we, oh, we sit up and we say, okay, now you've got the diagnosis of diabetes. But folks, what's happening between 5.2 and 6.5? Huge damage. Yes, obviously measurable by hemoglobin A1C. That's the obvious, easy measured thing. But here's why hemoglobin A1C is not, it doesn't matter. A1C doesn't matter other than a marker of disease. But here's what it's a marker of. Think about this, folks. Red blood cells float in our blood vessels, floating around in all blood vessels. So what? Who cares how much A1C glycosylation? Okay, so I can't breathe that well when I'm in Denver, but I breathe fine here in Jupiter, Florida. Who cares? Well, here's why you should care, because A1C is not the problem. A1C is a marker, and it's a marker of chronically elevated blood sugar. And there are two other very, very important factors within your bloodstream that are direct disease consequences. The first one is that the lining of your blood vessels, your blood vessels are lined by endothelial cells. The endothelial cells are the cells that line the blood vessels, and they should be flat like fried eggs, touching each other, okay? And I'll come back to that in a second. But what happens is chronically elevated levels of blood sugar, that sugar very quickly gets into the endothelial cells. Number one, it carries with it water. And that water takes these flat endothelial cells and rounds them up. So they go from fried eggs to boiled eggs. And there's a couple of problems with that. Also, sugar, elevated levels of sugar in the bloodstream carry a lot of water. Sugar is very hydrophilic. It sucks up a lot of water. So when your A1C is chronically up, it means your blood volume is chronically up because the sugar is retaining the water, not salt. Sugar is retaining the water. Sugar is the bad guy. And that means that your heart has to pump much harder and the left ventricular wall gets thicker. So your heart is becoming dysfunctional and you have a disease called hypertension. Again, whether it's treatable or not. Because 120 over 80 is not normal blood pressure. That's normal carbophilic blood pressure. And then when you get 135 over 85, 140 over 90, then they start putting you on medication. But damage is being done by that hypertension to all of your organs. Carbophilic hypertension, commonest cause of hypertension. But these endothelial cells swell up and they round up. I'll come to that in a second because it's such a cool pathway of discovery. But what happens then is as those endothelial cells round up, they bulge into the lumen, further narrowing the pipe by radius to the fourth power. And again, back pressure on the pump, 
adding to hypertension. But when those endothelial cells separate, they expose the underlying base membrane. Now, the surface of those endothelial cells is anticoagulant. Blood just slides right on by. But when you leave those little gaps, now you've got a rough area that is procoagulant, and your clotting cascade goes crazy. You form this little fibrin clot, and the fibrin clot plugs that little vessel. Well, what else does sugar do? Sugar activates the other cells floating in your bloodstream. What are they? They're your immune cells, your white blood cells. So now your white blood cells and before the white blood cells, and this is where my PhD comes from, folks. I looked at platelet dysfunction in the face of high sugar. What happens is the platelets get activated, platelets get stuck in that thrombus. They say, hey, neutrophils, hey, white cells, come on in, come on in, let's activate you. Come and join the party. And they're all getting ramped up. They're all getting high on sugar. They're all going crazy. They're releasing cytokines. They're releasing inflammation molecules. And they're forming this big inflammatory clot that now disrupts the base membrane of your blood vessels, activates the, sub, the underlying uh, smooth muscle, gets in there, forms a plaque. And then what happens is the neutrophils and the macrophages that get in there attract the deposition of lipid of fat and triglycerides and cholesterol to kind of try to smooth out that clot. That, ladies and gentlemen, is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that is caused directly by chronic excessive levels of blood sugar. And the marker for that is hemoglobin A1c. And when that disease gets high enough, we call it diabetes. But you don't have to have diabetes at 6.5 to have cardiovascular disease. Anywhere from 5.2 to 6.5, you're causing that damage. See how this works, folks? A1C is a direct marker of cardiovascular disease. So it's incumbent upon us to lower our blood sugar, and we measure that by a lowering of the A1C, but it's predictive of an improvement of cardiovascular disease. You know what's cool, folks? I'll just go down this road because I'm a total nerd and a geek. But what actually happens in those endothelial cells, the endothelial cells have a cytoskeleton, like this little inside skeleton. And it's made of actin. Yeah, the same thing that causes muscles to contract, actin and something called vimentin. And those filaments, when laid out, allow the endothelial cell to be nice and flat. Well, when sugar gets into those cells and under the influence of insulin, sugar bonds to those actin and the vimentin fibers and breaks them up. And they clump up and they form little round balls. In the liver cells, we call those uh, Mallory Denke bodies, which are visible under microscopy when those cells balloon out. But the same thing is happening in endothelial cells. Under the influence of that sugar, that sugar is damaging the endothelial cells, allowing them to round up. Because remember, round is a non-structural shape. To flatten out, it's a positive shape change. Negative shape change, you round up. So that's what's happening with endothelial cells. And the starting point is not lipid in the muscles. It's breakdown of endothelial cell function because of glycosylation of actin and myosin, uh, sorry, actin and vimentin fibrils within the, the microfilaments within endothelial cells that causes endothelial cell disruption, clotting. So this is a clotting inflammatory disease, cardiovascular disease. Ludicrous to treat it with a statin, but the marker is your A1C, folks. And if you've got an A1C, ha, 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 I'm 5.5, I'm fine. No, you're not. No, you're not. When you're 5.2 and lower, that's when you're okay. And we see 5.2 and lower in our ketogenic people once they become fat adapted. doesn't happen tomorrow. doesn't happen the next day. It takes six months, nine months, a year for that A1C to slowly come down. And even my worst diabetics, whether they are type 1 or type 2, by coming off carbohydrates and aggressively managing their blood sugars, whether it's with insulin, whether it's with diabetic medication or not, aggressively managing their blood sugars to keep that number below 100, preferably in the 70 and 80 range, can normalize their hemoglobin A1C, can normalize the insulin, and get rid of the risk of glucose-mediated atherosclerotic uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. That's what A1C is, folks. Now, here's what's really just so screwed up. Think about this. Think about how 
ridiculously poorly diabetes is managed. Number one, they only make the diagnosis of diabetes from 6.5, which is fine, neither here nor there. But what they do is people under 6.5, they may call them prediabetes and they say, ah, ha, ha, you've got to be careful, but you're okay. No, you're not. You're not okay. They lull you into a false sense of security and you may still have your heart attack because of that problem. See it every day. See it every day. Okay? Between 5'2 and 6'5, you're not okay. But once you get to 6'5, now we put you on your diabetic medication. Here's what's so screwed up, folks. Two things that are totally screwed up about diabetes management. Number one, they tell you to eat carbohydrates and then to use drugs to get rid of them, for, rid of those carbohydrates from your blood vessels. Well, as soon as the, the, the sugar is in your blood vessels, you're screwed. Using drugs to get rid of them. Don't eat carbohydrates. Don't, oh, I've got to eat 50 grams and 75 grams for a snack. <sighs> so screwed up. And the second bizarre part, and this just tells me how screwed up this is. The treatment goal for type 2 diabetics is a hemoglobin A1c below 7.0 on a logarithmic scale. So we diagnose at 6.5, and our treatment goal is to be below 7.0. Woohoo! Woohoo! My, my A1C is below 7. I'm so... <laughs> Folks, wake up. Smell the roses. Unless you've got COVID because you can't smell. Um, understand blood sugar and what it does. Understand that A1C is a marker of damage. And the treatment goal is to get to a point where your A1C is not affected by your blood sugar. Because at that level, your endothelial cells are safe, your immune system is nice and subdued and quiet, it's not ramped up and affected by cytokines from the clotting cascade. Your platelets are happy and healthy. Happy blood vessels equal happy people. Because remember, your blood vessels go to nearly every organ in the human body. So every organ is affected. Every organ is affected by abnormalities in your blood vessels. It is quintessential to human health. Take care of your blood sugar, take care of your blood vessels, and you will live long. Folks, if you like this content, if you like this discussion, set up a consult if you want some advice on how to do this. Text 561-517-0642 or hit us up on our website or leave some comments below and I'll reach out to you. Thanks for watching.